Hey everyone, welcome back. In today's lesson, we're gonna talk about the Renaissance. We'll define what a Renaissance actually is, how it got its start in Italy, and then how it spread throughout Europe, making major changes to society, life, and actually spurs the Reformation. So make sure you're in your interactive notebook and you're following along. All right, let's go ahead and get started. And we're on page eight of your interactive notebook. And again, we're talking about the Renaissance. First thing we wanna talk about is our essential question. So how did the Renaissance change life in Europe? First and foremost, let's talk about what is the Renaissance? What was it? If we wanna define it, it was an explosion of creativity in art, in writing, in thought. All of this is just major changes during this time period coming out of the medieval society and moving into kind of more modern times. Um, so it's lots of changes. Um, it lasts from about the 1300s to the 1600s, and it starts, as you can see in the title of the slide, in Italy, uh, most prominently in the city of Florence, and then it spreads later to later to different parts of Italy. Why did it start in Italy? The Crusades spurred a lot of trade, so people are moving around. Uh, the, growth, the growth of city-states starts to explode in Italy. And then also that Black Plague that we talked about in the prior lesson kills about 60% of Italy's population, and it really disrupts the economy. So there's a need for this change in Italy, and it's the best place. It's a really great place for it to kind of take off and run. Um, Italy also, as we talked about the different cities, um, had a lot of city-states kind of left over from Roman times, whereas the rest of Europe was very rural at this time. So it really wasn't developed quite as much as Italy. So Italy becomes kind of the best place to jump off with the Renaissance. We see a wealthy, mer a wealthy merchant class develop. And we also see artists and scholars, they're studying kind of and taking from the old ways, the, the Greeks, the Romans, looking at their artwork, their manuscripts, and we're kind of ha gonna put out like a fresh spin on it. That's kind of what the Renaissance was. It was taking the old stuff and revamping and tweaking, modernizing it and making it more fresh. One of the things that comes out of the Renaissance is the style uh, or an intellectual movement known as humanism. Um, what it is, is we have a movement focused on human achievements. So humanists study classical texts, history, literature, philosophy. And the Renaissance is going to start to show that we are going to be more secular as opposed to spiritual. The word secular means non-religious. As we've talked about in prior uh, lessons here, we've seen this, you know, where the church and state were merged together and we're going to slowly start to see them separate to be the church and the state which is what it is today in most um in most government structures most countries around the world there is a clear separation as we say between the church and the state um so this is kind of one of those sparks that starts to separate the two um, Renaissance, people living in the Renaissance are more concerned about the here and now, not so much concerned about an afterlife or, you know, heaven and hell or whatever, um, if we're going from the Christian religion. Wealthy people are enjoying fine food, uh, nice homes, good clothes. Uh, during the Middle Ages, you know, we talked about how it was kind of dirty and dingy and not fun. Um, people are kind of living the good life during this time period. We also see people who are patrons of the arts. Patrons are going to be financial supporters of the arts. We're going to see a lot of different artists and sculptors and, you know, um, writers. They're all going to pop up. They need money to fund their projects. So, you know, once we start to see that, hey, you're pretty good at what you do, patrons will pour in money, kind of support their work, you know, purchase their artworks, hire them for projects, so on and so forth. Um, ch church officials are... are um, well known for doing this as well. They spent a lot of money to beautify a lot of the different cities. One of the great examples, I'll show a picture here, uh, Michelangelo, a very famous artist, was contracted to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Um, it took him a number of years of like basically like him laying on his back and like painting upside down. Um, but this is one example of how, you know, in the church is also a patron of the arts at this time period. We have it during this time period, the phrase Renaissance man and woman. Renaissance man is a little bit more well known, but Renaissance men and women come out of this time period. And what that means is a Renaissance man is a universal man. They change up 
kind of what it is to be a man and a woman at this time. So instead of just knowing how to do like one thing, a Renaissance man is going to excel in many fields. They're going to read, they're going to write, they're going to paint, they're going to um, write poetry, they're going to be well, well versed in politics, in combat, they're going to be charming and witty and just a jack of all trades, um, as a common cliche. Um, a lot of this comes from a book that's published called The Courtier, um, and it teaches a person how, or a man, how to become a Renaissance man. A very famous Renaissance man from this time period would be Leonardo da Vinci. Very famous painter, sculptor, inventor, scientist. Uh, two works you might know of him. He painted the Mona Lisa, which is pictured here. And he also painted a very famous religious photo or religious portrait, um, The Last Supper. Um, so two things that he's very well known for. But again, he, had, he did other things, um, as you can see there. Renaissance women were also taught in the same book how to be Renaissance women. Um, basically it was upper class women, not necessarily the lower class. They should be educated, they should be charming, and then they should be kind of muses, as we'll say. Uh, they should inspire art, but they shouldn't necessarily be out there creating it. So women are not really getting more power. There are a few here and there that do, um, but for the most part, again, they should be, you know, there to inspire it, but not necessarily participate and create art at this time period. We do see a revolution in artistic style. We see um, a realistic style that's copied from classical art, usually to portray religious subjects. Painters are going to use a new style known as perspective in their portraits. And this is going to give a picture a more 3D or a more realistic, um, you know, popping off of that canvas. Um, during this time period. We're going to see realistic portraits of prominent citizens. We're going to see sculptures that are going to show natural positions and expressions. And one of the, the most famous um, sculptures that we see in the over and over, people really like to sculpt him, is going to be the biblical David. You know, David, if you know anything about uh, the Christian religion, there's a popular story um, of David and Goliath. David is um, a popular model, I guess we'll say, um, for sculptors during this time period. Um, we're going to see a lot of um, portraits, like I said, of prominent citizens. Like this is where we start to see those grand portraits of uh, royal families come out where, you know, the king and the queen, um, all of that is going to come out of this time period. The Renaissance is able to spread its ideas through a couple of different methods. Um, as people start to um, visit Italy, they kind of go home and then they're like, oh, let's try and do this. You know, it's like when you visit somewhere and you're like, oh, I liked how they did this. Let me do it there. So the Renaissance starts to spread a little bit like by word of mouth. Uh, we had the Hundred Years War end in 1453. That's going to help cities start to grow rapidly. And we're going to see different merchants in northern cities um, grow very wealthy, wealthy. And then they're going to also become patrons of the arts and they're going to sponsor some of those artists. England and France also become well-developed nations. Uh, they don't unify together. They unify under a specific monarch, which is a king or a queen. Um, and then those kings and queens are also patrons of the arts. So they're pouring money into these Renaissance type projects. So again, like I said on the pr previous slide, the idea of having a royal family painted um, during this time period, they're gonna have to pay the painter. So again, they're uh, patrons of the arts. Another way that the Renaissance spread is through the invention of the printing press. Now we did have a printing press that was kind of around in 1050 or 1045, about 1045, um, Bai Sheng, hopefully that's right, of China, invented a type of movable type. It used a separate piece of type for every single Chinese character. Um, so it's kind of not like what we had, you know, what we was practical at the time for you know the English language. So by 1440, a guy by the name of Johann Gutenberg, he's from Germany, he develops a printing press. It's the very first one that's ever created um, and it allowed for quick type, cheap book production. Um, and I say it's the first printing press because it's the first one that you can actually do movable type. Definitely he's gonna be influenced by the 
guy from China. Um, but this is the first one that doesn't use one character per page. It's going to be the whole shebang, all the letters together. Um, and again, remember, the Chinese language is much different from the English language. Um, so a little bit different of a style. So anyway, um, it allows for quick, cheap book production. And why that is important is because now that we have books, more people can become educated, become literate. They're reading, they're spreading these ideas. The very first book that was printed from the Gutenberg press was, it was printed in 1455 and it's big, like, I think I have the picture here. Hopefully I was able, I don't know. I have to look it up, but it should be here somewhere, hopefully. Um, but the first book that was printed, it was a Bible and it becomes known as the Gutenberg Bible. So some of the legacies of the Renaissance, what comes out of it? Um, two big categories, changes in the arts and changes in, the, in societies. So art was very influenced by, you know, the classical styles from Greece and Rome that we talked about in the previous unit. We see more realistic portrayals of individuals and nature outside. Uh, we see art starting to become both religious and secular. So we're painting religious type portraits. Again, Leonardo da Vinci is a great example of that. We have the Last Supper, and then we have something that's non-religious, just a random model, Mona Lisa. We have writers using vernacular, which is them writing in their own language, their own way of their own way of speaking. And we also see that art is praising individual achievement. Changes in society included, uh, again, the printing press was made and made information widely available. Prior to the printing press, in order to get a book written, you literally had to hand write it. Not, not cool, you know, not, not fun. Um, you know, usually it was monks in monasteries. They were hand copying it. Now that you have a machine that can do it, it's going to ramp up production. And so they can get the word out there more. Uh, we're going to see, again, we're going to see people who are illiterate becoming the benefit of that. Um, they're going to be able to have books read to them. Eventually, then they might be picking up reading on their own. We're going to see published accounts of maps and charts going to start leading to different discoveries. You know, again, this takes place 1300 to 1600, smack dab in there. 1492 is when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Um, thought he was in East Indian and he was in the wrong spot, but you know, they made that major discovery of the North Americas. Um, also, we're going to see public um, published legal proceedings. They're going to make rights clearer to people. So they're going to understand like, oh, if I break a law, this is what happens. You know, if I, I do this, this is the punishment. So maybe I shouldn't do that. And then finally, we are going to see political structures and religious practices practices being questioned. So people are going to start challenging the government. They're going to start challenging their faith. And that is going to lead us into our next lesson on the Protestant Reformation. So make sure you have this in your interactive notebook and then tune in for that lesson. Thanks for watching.